good. Amen. Amen. So a, a couple quick side notes before we get started. Um, first of all, if you're a, if you're a, a visitor today for the first time, same thing we always say. If you're a if you're here for the first time, you're a guest one time. The next time, you're familia. We love you. We're a church that likes to high five. We like to knuckle. We like, you know, that's just how we are. Another thing I always like to say for everyone's benefit is that we are a church that, that, that God put on my heart. Do we have anybody else here that was raised in the church? Anybody else grow up in the church around here, right? And, and, and what happened was is that a lot of times over the years, something happened to where a lot of people transitioned over from doing church to following a program. And I believe that's partially what's wrong with our world today is that we're more focused on a program. We're more focused on being in church at a certain time and we have to be out at a certain time and the, the worship could only worship for 20 minutes and the pastor better not preach over 30 minutes. We, we have tried to put God in a box, but we live in a world that's going to hell in a handbasket and we wonder why and that's because we can scroll on our phones for hours on end. We can watch Netflix for hours on end. We can watch back-to-back -back NBA championship games, but we can't be in the word of God for as long as he wants us to be in and that's what we got to start doing. Amen? I wanted to bring something, man. I want you to know, and most of you already know, that what God has put on my heart since two years ago when we began the transition over is a church that where we're going to keep it real. We're going to keep it real. For anybody in here that's new today, I say this for your benefit. The congregation's tired of hearing me say it, but don't look up to me. Don't put me on a pedestal. I'm a man that fails like everyone else. When you come, it's just my job to direct you to Jesus. He's the one that deserves all the honor and glory. Not a church, not a man, not a denomination. It's all about Jesus Christ. Amen? I say that. I tell our cameraman, get that on camera, because if anybody ever comes up and says, Dave, you're supposed to be perfect. That's a life in the pit of hell I've never claimed to. I never want to. I am submitted to God. I am saved by grace. And I'm on a mission like everybody else. Amen? Amen. It's not about acting like you're something. It's about striving to get close to God so he can change you. It's about being a warrior for God. Amen? Amen. It's about being a warrior for God. I said it before, when we were out in the world, we did a lot of things. When we were out in the world, we weren't afraid to act a fool in a bar. We weren't afraid to act a fool at the Bronco game. We weren't afraid to make a bunch of noise. Why do we get all shy when we come to the house of the Lord? Why do we quit praising God when we come to the house of the Lord? Why do we get quiet all of a sudden? There's no need to get quiet. Amen? We are saved, sanctified. We have something to thank God about. There's people up in here that have been saved by drug addiction. There's people in here that have been saved from a terrible life. There's people in here that have been healed and saved from terrible relationships. And I'm here to tell you today that God's not done. God's not done. But God desires us to surrender our hearts to him. God desires us to quit pointing the finger at him and blaming him for everything. Well, I don't believe in God because of this. And I don't believe in God because of that. And instead, get in our Bible and understand God's will and how we're supposed to march. The Bible says that in this world, we will have what? Trials and tribulations. And tribulations. It's not going to be easy, but God is calling warriors, not hirelings. God's calling those that are willing to get off the bench and get in the world and begin to help people. Well, Dave, that's not my problem. I don't want to deal with people. Dave, I don't go to church because everyone's a hypocrite. Well, cool, look in the mirror. You're a hypocrite too. Welcome to the club. It's only by God's saving grace that any of us could stand before him and be, amen? I've shared with people many times before that I'm not in this to make friends. I'm not in this. If, if I was in this for numbers, I would come and tell everyone what they want to hear. But I'm not in this for that. I'm in this to speak the truth of God regardless whether there's two people in here or whether we're backed out out there. And God will do the rest, right? Because we need soldiers, right? Not actors. Amen? And for anybody that's in here today that you feel less than, you feel like God can't use you, you feel like you've done too wrong. I'm here to tell you that's a life in the pit of hell, man. God loves you. You're never too far away from God. If he's forgiven some of the people that are up in here, he'll forgive you. you got to hear the testimony someday, right? We're not, a, we're not a church. We're not here to be a museum of perfect people. We are a hospital of broken people that have come to the Lord that are just here to witness to everyone else that's out there hurting too. Amen? Welcome. Thank you. Uh, I want to just say, when you come to our church, you're going to see a lot of different stuff. There's people that will worship in different ways, and you know what? They're open to worship like that. 
There's people that are going to come. We're not going to restrict them from worshiping. Like I said, we're more concerned with worshiping God than keeping a nice, prim, proper order. Amen? It's all about Jesus. It's kind of funny because I was talking with a pastor friend of mine from Albuquerque yesterday. And, uh, and he was laughing. He called to check up on me. He's like, Dave. So how's the church been going, man? How you guys doing? And I'm like, well, brother, um, despite me, the church has been growing for a long time now. God has been doing something good. As a matter of fact, to all you that are coming, praise the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll be adding a second service here very soon for all of you guys. Amen? And, and he was asking me, you know, how are things been going? I'm like, well, brother, you remember what they told me when I first took over. He's like, yeah. They said, Dave, the way you preach and the way you talk, you're going to clear that place out. No one's going to want to come to you. I had people instructing me, telling me, listen, and, and I, I always say this. I had people instructing me, Dave, Dave, you should buy some suits, brother. You have to wear suits if you're going to preach. Dave, you should do this. Dave, don't bring up this. And I said, you know what? That's exactly the opposite of what I want to do. I want to be real. I want to keep it real. I want to preach the unadulterated word of God, and I'm going to present myself how I am so people can see that there's not some fake benchmark to try to keep, but we can come to the Lord as we are and bring him the honor and glory, and God will do great things in our lives. We live in a world that's wrecked and hurt and things are going on. And half of the problem is, is that a great majority of God's church has been acting. A great majority of God's church has been playing the part. But yet out in the real world, in their homes, in their jobs, in other places, you wouldn't know they're a Christian by the way they act. The Bible said that you would know them by their fruit. The Bible said that, they, that you would know that they are his disciples by the love that they give. And sadly, a lot of people in church don't walk in that. They they walk in some kind of self-entitlement that they deserve some kind of respect because of a title. I've said it all along. I don't care how long you've been in this church. If you fail to have a heart for Christ and if you fail to just seek after the power of the Holy Spirit, be, don't be surprised when one of these young bucks coming in jumps you in ministry and begins to take off because it's not about a good old boy system here. It's about moving forth the army of the Lord so that we can reach Brighton and our families for Jesus Christ. Amen. Man, I'm on fire this morning. And let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. What you guys have, I'm not a professional speaker. I'm going to tell you right now, and you guys know it. There, there, there's pastors out there that are so much more eloquent than me, so much better than me. But my passion is studying the word of God, and my passion is actually re reaching people. It's not sitting in an office. It's getting out there and doing the work. And let me just share this so I don't get in trouble, right? Some of my board members might come up and pull me off of here. Last night, we were in a place, and we were involved in some ministry in a place where most people would never step foot. Last night, we were out there with where the Satan worshipers are at. Last night, we were out there where there's a hardcore goth group, goth following, and we were out there lifting up the name of Jesus Christ, and we were doing work. And I'll tell you what, you can begin to feel the heaviness, but man, I want to tell you about the power of my Jesus. As we were sitting out there and as, as there was ministry taking place in this place that usually uplifts Satan, right? And as we were out there, I was so blessed that as we were out there praying and as we were doing our thing, I looked up and it, made, it brought me to tears to see an old brother. This brother had to have been late 70s, maybe early 80s, and he was standing on the balcony of this building with his hands over everyone that was talking to the people, and he was praying for three hours straight without stopping, <laughs> covering people in the blood. If I feel led of the Lord, I'll share with you guys some of the stuff that happened, and I'll share with you guys some other things. I don't feel led right now. Very heavy stuff. When I tell you that we were walking in the presence of witches and we were walking in the presence of other things, I do not lie to you. But guess what? I'm not afraid of any of that because our God is greater. Our God is stronger. Our God is powerful. He has already conquered. He will expose the lies. And there's no weapon formed against us that shall prosper because we are more than conquerors in Jesus. The Jezebel spirit will not, will not will not be allowed in this place. Demonic spirits will not be allowed in this place. We will not allow manipulation in this place. We will allow the Holy Spirit to move in Jesus' name. Well, Dave, why are you fired up? Why are you sharing this stuff? Because my heart's on fire because of what we've seen last night, and my heart's on fire because of the word that we have today. The church 
needs to go back to what it used to be. The church needs to go back to the organic, the disciples preaching to the lost, not being too comfortable sitting on a perch, but getting out to the hurting and reaching them for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not coming on Easter and, and Christmas and kneeling down and getting up and kneeling down and getting up and this time service ends and this time service starts, but truly entering into worship so that our children and the lost can see the Holy Spirit move. How many of you know we need to see a move of the Holy Spirit in this country? Amen? In this town. And so if you have your Bibles with me, I want you to open up to 1 Samuel chapter 10 today. 1 Samuel chapter 10. And we're, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to very, very quickly take you through several chapters as we journey through the Bible like we've been doing for a year and a half already. It's been a year and a half and we're barely in 1 Samuel. That's funny, huh? I think we spent six months in Genesis. But God is good. It's rich. Amen? How many of you know the Old Testament isn't antiquated and it shouldn't be put to the side? The Old Testament is a story that shows us the journey to Jesus Christ and why we should have so much respect for what was done on the cross. Amen? So if you remember... Those of you who, uh, who haven't been here, you can find all of our sermons that go before this on our YouTube channel. Feel free to ask one of our ushers, our cameraman, or myself for those links, and we can get you to those. But we had been, we got out of the book of Judges, and we talked about a period of time where your great, the great men of God, they were gone. Your Moses, Joshua's, they were gone. There was a period of judges where it was very dark in Israel. There was no one to lead. And God would send a man here, a woman there, right? Your Deborahs, right? Your, your, your different people to step up and to take control. But it was still a very dark time where the children of Israel kept reverting back to doing the wrong thing. They kept reverting back to worshiping false idols. They kept reverting back to going against God. As we entered into 1 Samuel, we, we found the story of a beautiful woman, right? Hannah, who, who had her life submitted to God. And the Lord told her, right? He promised her that she was going to have this son, but he had to be dedicated to the service of God, to Yahweh. And as a young man, Samuel was raised in the temple. And we went over the story about he didn't have the best role models. He was under the care of some priests that were very wicked, Eli and his sons, right? And as time went on, we see how Samuel progressed and, his, and, his, and, and the, the favor that God gave him in Israel grew and grew and grew. So now we come in. Samuel's an old man. Samuel has been famous throughout the lands, not only as a leader, a judge, a prophet. Now, a couple Sundays ago, we talked about how the people had been clamoring for a king. You see, there was a time where it had kind of gotten stagnant, and Samuel's sons were not being the best of examples. And people began to turn and look to other nations and say, we want a king like they have. We want what they have, neglecting what God had done to them. Mind you, God had brought them. They had crossed over the Red Sea. They had crossed the Jordan. God had given them victory in Jericho. So many miracles, right, had already happened. But still they wanted to doubt God. Still they, they, they wanted what the world wanted instead. Isn't it crazy that many times in our lives, God can do so much for us. He can be so faithful. He can give us things. We see him move, but the minute things don't go our way, or the minute we get too lazy to read the Bible, we begin to drift away. We don't want what God wants no more. Now we're asking God to give us what the world has, not even knowing that that's what's going to destroy us. How many of you know that we don't have all the answers? We don't have all the answers. God, if only you would give me that man or that woman, I would serve you better. That's a lie from the pit of hell. You might be stepping right into a problem. But Dave, they go to church. My buddy, the devil sits in the pews sometimes. We are to have wisdom and to trust in God's will. And that's all he ever wanted from the children of Israel was to trust him. Trust him when things were going good. Trust him when things were going bad. He's not only the God of the mountain, he's the God of the valley also. Amen? Amen. And it's in the valleys, it's in the trials that we figure out who we really are. You see, many people claim to be Christians. Many people claim to be warriors for God. But that can be quickly tested as soon as hard times in life hit. When hard times in life hit, you find out who someone really is in Jesus. You know why? 
If you don't have a strong relationship with God, you dip and you jump ship. Oh, God wasn't there for me. Oh, why did God do this? Why did God, instead of standing there and saying, Lord, you carried a cross, you suffered, how is it any different for me? If you serve the Lord, you're going to be beaten. The devil's going to come after you, amen? And so they'd been asking for a king, and Samuel prayed to the Lord. And as we shared a couple Sundays ago, the Lord gave Samuel a message. He's like, okay, there's free will. Give them what they want. They want a king. And he began to share everything that they were going to go through. You want a male, you want a human king over you? He's going to take advantage of you. He's going to send your sons to the front line to die in war. He's going to take your daughters and have them serve him and his people. He said everything that was going to happen. But yet they still desired a king. And so the Lord showed Samuel who he was going to appoint. And so Samuel went and they found this man. And, and, and this was also part of our sermon. I'm giving you guys a recap because we, we took a couple weeks off for Palm Sunday and, and Easter Sunday. And they found a man named Saul. And the Bible says that he was head and shoulders above everybody else, all the other Israelites. It says he was a handsome man. Ladies, this was the guy that would have been on the front of the Fabio books, okay? The, the, you know when you go to Safeway and you see those books, the romance novels right there? Yeah, this dude would have been on the front of those. It says that he was handsome. He was a stunner, right? It said that he would turn heads. This guy was a good-looking guy. What was wrong with that? Well, there was nothing inherently wrong with that. The problem was is that they wanted what the carnal mind wanted. They wanted what their idea, what, what a king would be, instead of what God wanted them to lead. You see, God doesn't look at our outside appearance. God looks to our heart. God's not looking for a supermodel to do stuff for him. God's looking for someone who has a surrendered heart. Amen? And so they went through this process. They found Saul. He, he told Saul, you're going to be the king. And we go into 10, where Saul is anointed king. And I'm going to jump through different parts of this. That way we can get to the main point that I want to share. So just trek with me. It says, Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head, speaking of Saul, and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance? When you have departed from me today, you will find two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zelzah. And they will say to you, The donkeys which you went to look for have been found. And now your father has ceased caring about the donkeys and is worrying about you. So what shall I do about my son? Then you shall go forward from there and come to the terebinth tree of Tabor. You see, he was giving him detailed instructions on where he was going to go and what he was going to do. Prior to that, he had been out serving his father. His father was a very wealthy man. He came from a wealthy family. You see, he started off right, but as you're going to find out in the next couple weeks, Saul did not end right. He did not end his story right. How many of you know that it's not how you started your life out, but it's how you finish your life? It's not how good you did something in the beginning, but it's going to be how good you did it at the end, whether you leave a legacy for people to actually remember you by. Brother Londi referred to funerals. And you know what's really sad is when you have people that all they were known for in life was partying. And we see it very often. We do a lot of funerals here. And we'll have, half, we'll have maybe the first three rows filled. And that's all the people that want to come and commemorate them. That's it. That was their legacy. But when you see a man or woman of God that has passed away, that served people, that loved people, that was an example to his family, his grandkids, his great-grandkids, most of the time we can't even keep them in this building. They're all the way out the back. I don't know about you. I want to leave a legacy. I don't want to just leave a memory that people forget in two, three, four years. Amen? And so he tells Saul, Go forth. Go do what you're going to do. They're going to be waiting. And Saul went, and, they, and, they were, and they were, there was a time that they were waiting for him. And the Lord came upon Saul because in the, in the beginning he did have the right heart. And it says that as Saul came down, that, they began to, that there was people that met him there. And it was by divine guidance of God. They were playing the tambourines. They were playing the flutes. And they were prophesying. And it says the Lord came upon Saul and he began to prophesy with them to where people said, wow, this guy, this guy really must be anointed by God. He must be the real deal. 
So they begin to accept him in, and they begin to see what was coming down the road. Now in 10, verse 17, it says this. Then Samuel called to the people together of the Lord at Mizpah and said to the children of Israel, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I have brought you up out, brought Israel out of Egypt and delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all kingdoms and from those who oppressed you. But you have today rejected your God who himself saved you from all your adversities and all your tribulations. And you have said to him, No, set a king over us. Now therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your clans. Now check this out. After everything that God had done for them, they were still clamoring to have it their way. How many of you know it's not about our way, it's about God's way? As a matter of fact... Um, Brother Dave and Susan made me a shirt that's really cool. It says, it's not my way, it's Yahweh, right? Yahweh, pretty cool play on words, right? It's about God's way. And they wanted to do it their way. But imagine how awkward this coronation was. They asked for a king, and they had a certain idea of what they wanted this king to look like. Just like all of us have a certain idea of what we think our church should look like, what we think our pastor should act like and talk like, what we think the worship should be like, what we think our Christian walk. And we don't ever seek God to say, Lord, just tell me the truth about my life. Tell me the truth of how you want to lead me. It's never been about religion. It's always been about relationship. Religion won't save you. Religion will turn you away from God. Religion will make you all gross and hard-necked and, and bitter towards everyone. It's only relationship of Jesus that will cause you, to, cause you to look at someone, even someone who's hateful to you, and say, I feel sorry for you. I love you. I want to pray for you. It's relationship, not religion. Amen? Now think about this. Think about this for a minute. Saul is called up. And they're introducing him as a king. They're anointing him. Imagine how awkward this was. Come on up, man. I'm going to introduce, introduce you as king. And the way he starts off is, okay, you all wanted to go against God? You guys all wanted to, de to defy God? You didn't think that God was good enough? This is what you're getting. Can you imagine Saul back there like, whoa, brother, I thought you were going like, to like amp me up a little bit. I thought you were going to be my hype man. Get them all excited for me. What are you doing? Like, you're making me look bad right off the bat. But Samuel was being honest. He wasn't playing a, a political leader that would say what the people wanted to hear. He was saying exactly what had hurt the heart of God. And he was letting them know that you're going to get what you asked for, but be ready for the consequences that followed also. Many times in our lives, we ask God for something. And we push God about a job, about a relationship, about something. And we push it and we push it. And God doesn't answer us for a very specific reason. But we keep pushing it. And because God gives free will, many times he's like, okay, I'm going to grant you that. And then something goes wrong, and what's the first thing that we do? God, it's your fault. It's not God's fault. If, you would, if we would have been patient and waited on the Lord, he would have guided us in the right direction. He would have told us. And we're going to find out that Saul had that very same issue, that he couldn't wait on the Lord. He couldn't do that. And so Samuel warned them all, told them what was going to happen. He called all the tribes together and let them know exactly what God was going to do. Samuel explained to the people in verse 25. And he wrote a book about royalty. He said, this is what royalty looks like according to God, according to the Torah. This is what should be done. And he gave them that book. Now going in through verse 11, the Lord uses Saul for the first time to have victory. There was a, the, the first battle that happened where Saul still had his head on straight. He was still focused on what God was doing, and the Lord gave him a victory. But very quickly, we see, and I'm going through this because I want to get to the meat of this message. In, ver in chapter 12, there's some things that happen, and it's, it was Samuel speaking at Saul's coronation. Now, it was the crowning of Saul at Gilgal that represented a fresh start for the Israelites. And it's interesting because where they coronated Saul as king, Gilgal, it was actually the site near Jericho from where the Israelites first launched their conquest to begin with when they came into the promised land. They were almost at square one. And the Lord was like, here you go. You're starting back over. This is what you've asked for. This is what's going to happen. As Israel prepared to install Saul as its first king, 
Samuel reminded the nation of the history, and he gave them the overview of where they had come from, everything that God had delivered them from. They had already been warned. They knew. Now we go into 13. And I want to I read this. I want to share this. Now it says in chapter 13, Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul, Saul chose for himself 3,000 men of Israel. 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash in the mountains of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin. Jonathan was Saul's son. The rest of the men he sent away, every man to his tent. And Jonathan attacked the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba. And the Philistines heard of it. Then Saul blew the trumpet throughout the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. Now all Israel heard it and said that Saul had attacked the garrison of the Philistines. So we begin to see Saul's leadership traits that are wrong here. And it's pretty interesting that our, our special guests, that I'm very, very, very blessed and honored to have them, they're called One Accord. And we're talking today about being in one accord. Saul and his son Jonathan were not in one accord. We see Saul's real attitude begin to come out. What happened? Well, in those days, it was customary that whoever won the war, whoever led them in war, was the one that raised the trumpet and sounded it. Not somebody else. And what happened? Saul's son Jonathan goes in there, mighty men of valor, strong warriors, precision swordsmen went in and they won a battle and what happened Saul blows the trumpet right away and everybody in Israel is like King Saul did it it was King Saul Saul did it his son Jonathan got no praise no pat on the back but as you're gonna learn his son Jonathan never wanted that he walked in humility it was Saul that was seeking to get the credit from man it was Saul that was looking for a pat on the back okay just track with me here. We're going we're gonna to bring this into today's terms here in a minute. So Saul took the credit. He, they blew it for everyone to hear. Verse 5. Then the Philistines gathered together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen. Now that had to have been extremely scary for the people of Israel because, mind you, they were pretty primitive in nature. They didn't have the fanciest weapons. They didn't have their own chariots and horses. It was not equal. The Philistines had very advanced blacksmiths in that time. They were able to build beautiful chariots. They had, they had weapons that nobody else had. So the people of God were very much outmatched. But you know, you know that's how God likes it, right? God likes when the odds are against his people. That way when he gives them the victory, they cannot claim that it was them, but they give all praise to Yahweh who was the one that brought them to victory. And they came up and encamped in Michmash and the east of Beth Avon. Verse 6. When the men of Israel saw that they were in danger, for the people were dispressed, they went and they hid in caves, in thickets, in rocks, in holes, in pits. And some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Now, he had already taken credit for his son's work. We can see that he was a very prideful person that wanted everyone to praise him. And what we begin to see here is that he's not leading his people in faith to be victorious and to be bold in, in, in Yahweh. But instead, what happened? They all ran and hid. They ran away because they seen the enemy coming. They wanted nothing to do with this. His son Jonathan, on the other hand, was not afraid. He was never afraid. And so as they, as they went into this, there was a, a rule that was established a long time ago that only the priests could bring a sacrifice to the Lord, right? We went through all of the, all of the tabernacle and everything that was, that was important with that. Only the priests could bring a sacrifice. And Samuel had already told Saul that, you know, you're not allowed to do that. I am the one that will bring it. He told Saul, wait there and be patient. I will be there. I will be there and I will come and instruct you on what the Lord wants us to do. Well, again, we see the character flaw. Saul didn't want to wait for God. He waited. He waited. As a matter of fact, Samuel said, I'll be there in seven days. Well, seven days went by and Samuel wasn't there. So what did he do? You know what? I can't wait for this guy no more. I'm going to do it myself. So he called his guys together and told them, bring me the sacrifice. I'll do it myself. And he sacrificed unto the Lord. He wasn't a priest. He didn't even have his heart right yet. He sacrificed unto the Lord. 
And then the prophet Samuel shows up and he's greatly, greatly discouraged that he could not wait and follow the ways of God. As a matter of fact, in verse 11 of chapter 13, Samuel shows up and he says, What have you done, Saul? And Saul said, When I saw the people were scattered from me, and that you did not come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered together at Michmash, then I said, The Philistines will now come down to me at Gilgal, and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. You see, it wasn't about waiting on the Lord. It was, I'll just do it for the Lord. How many times do we jump out in front of the Lord instead of praying and waiting for his will? Hey, I'm going to start this ministry in the church. Hey, I'm going to do this, or I'm going, to make this, I'm going to make this move on behalf of my family. I'm going to make this move on behalf of my marriage. And we do it without praying and fasting, and we expect that just because we say that it's in the church, or just because we're Christians, we expect that God's going to automatically bless it. No. We pray, we fast, and we go to God first, and we say, Lord, please lead us in this move. God, I don't know if you want me to have this job. What if there's someone there that's going to hurt me? What if there's someone there that's going to lead me down the wrong path? I want you to guide me. Lord, what about this relationship? You see, we should be praying to God and asking him for, to lead us in our every move. Well, Dave, that means we'll be praying all the time. What does the Bible say? It says pray without what? Without ceasing. Pray over everything. Well, Dave, that seems so hard. Well, if you're involved in religion and not relationship, that is hard. But if you're in relationship with Jesus Christ, you're already talking to him all day. But Dave... How am I going to find time to get on my knees that many times during the day? See, when you're in religion, you have to follow certain steps where you think God's going to heal you. But when you're in relationship, you could be walking through the halls of your school and just saying, Lord, please heal them. They look like they're hurting. God, I ask you to bless these people. I ask you, Father God, to cast the spirits out of this school, to have your presence known in here, to bring people in here that are unashamed. You're at work and you're walking around and you're praying. You don't have to stop what you're doing. Why? Because you're not trying to fit God into your schedule. God is your schedule and he, he goes around everything that you do, amen? He's involved in everything. When you're driving, you can pray. When you, you know... And God wanted him to seek him. God so wanted him to get it right. But see, God is all-knowing. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent. He knew what was going to happen. But the only way that people were going to learn is if they had to go through it. This is where you want to brace yourself because I might start offending some people. In our country... We've wanted things a certain way for a long time. You see, it started by them removing prayer out of schools. It started by us saying that we didn't need God no more. And we began to see the negative things that would begin to come down the line. And we've pushed God more and more away. And we wanted more of sexual freedoms and sexual revolutions. And we wanted more of be ourselves and take away the things. Let's go ahead and feminize the man and let's knock him down not to be the head of the house no more. Let's go ahead and destroy the woman and, and take away what God has blessed her, the, the powerful gifts that he has given. Let's go ahead and screw it all up so people could be all confused. And now they don't know if they're this gender, that gender, or a hundred other genders. I'll tell you right now, God created them male and he created them female. Female, and that's the way he did it. We stood here in this country and said that we didn't want this. We want to tear down our military. We want to tear down our police. We want to burn our flags. They can come and assault churches. Someone could go into a Christian school and murder innocent children, and it's okay. But let someone else do it, and all the blame goes to God and everything else. You see, what we are seeing today is what happened to them back then. They wanted what they wanted, and God said, if you want it, I'm going to give it to you, but prepare to eat of what you've asked for. And right now, anybody that has a problem with what's going on in this country, we need to stop. 2 Chronicles 7.14, right? If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and what? Turn from your wicked ways, then I will come and I will heal their land. Amen? We're not much different than what was happening back then. We asked for this. We wanted to be led by a glorified Hollywood that lies to everybody. We wanted to be led. Come on now. Where does judgment start? In the house of the Lord. 
We wanted to be led by mega churches that will tell you exactly what you want to hear, but yet they deny the power thereof. We wanted this. So anybody that has a problem with what's going on in this world, we need to hit our knees and repent and say, Lord, forgive us for what we've done. Our country asked for this. Now we're getting what we asked for. How do we get healed from this? We get healed by turning back to God, getting in our word, every single person being responsible for your home, your children, praying the best you can. Are any of us ever going to be perfect? No. But we do the best we can. We read the Bible. Let me tell you something. It doesn't matter how many deliverance classes you take. It doesn't matter if you go to a prophetic convention. It doesn't matter what you do. All of that stuff is irrelevant. Get in the word of God. Pray and the Holy Spirit will lead you. Walk in truth. This is our plumb line. You can fake it all you want to, but this is the power. David, what's your proof in all that? My proof is, all I got to do is look to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When he was in the wilderness and the devil came to tempt him, he didn't say, well, my, hey, Satan, hold on. Wait a minute. I went through a five-step deliverance program, and I know how to handle this. He didn't say, I just got out of a prophetic conference. I know how to handle this. Oh, I was just trained in a Christian college how to do this. No, you know what Jesus did? He began to quote scripture out of the Bible, and it scared the enemy to where the enemy backed up. I'm here to tell you today, you don't need professional training. You don't need to go to all this stuff. We just need to get in our Bibles, be filled with the Holy Spirit, and be ready to move with whatever God tells us to do. Amen? People could tell me I'm crazy. It doesn't matter, man, because I'm watching what God is doing out there. In here, I've told you guys before, I love everybody in here, but my, the, the dearest part of ministry is not here. The dearest part of ministry is out there. When I see God doing miracles that I could have never imagined would happen, but it's by his power, not a man. Why? Because none of us are worthy of God. None of us are worthy of God. Who here fails on a weekly basis? The more we get real with ourselves and we quit trying to act like some kind of religious Pharisee or Sadducee, the more God's going to move in our life when we realize that we are broken people in need of a Savior to give our lives every day working out our salvation to God. Now give me a second because the Holy Spirit's putting some stuff on my heart, on my mind. Yeah, Dave, the church hurt me. That's why I'm not there. Get over it, man. You don't quit your job because someone in your job hurts you. Oh, Someone in school hurt me. You ain't get up and leave your school. Deal with it. This is a group of people that are from all different walks of life. We're not always going to get along, but we are called to come in one accord under Jesus and learn to move forward in him and get over it, get over ourselves, and do what we got to do for God. Amen? It's time we quit blaming God for everything that went wrong and start digging in deep and looking. Well, Dave, I don't believe in, in this and I don't believe in that. Then let's sit down and let's chop it up because the history is there. The archaeological studies are there. Right through apologetics, you will see even science backs up most. Well, Dave, but science disproved God in this. That's a lie from the pit of hell. As a matter of fact, most of solid science backs up everything in the Bible. And then there's also theory-based science. Man, I can go on forever, but I won't do that. You guys will be here till like, the Nuggets game tonight. But um, there's plenty of proof. But you know what's the problem? A lot of pastors have gotten lazy. They don't want to dig into apologetics. They don't want to have classes to teach their people what happened. Noah's Ark, that's a fake story. Is it really a fake story? There's actually camera, proof, satellite. They have found it. It is in Mount Ararat. They have went. There's pieces of wood they've brought out. They know it's there. They don't deny it. There's so many things, right? Every story in the Bible is so rich in history. But I'm not here to convince you. I'm here to share what Jesus did for me. Whether you believe in him or not is a matter of faith. And we're going we're gonna to get to that here in a minute as we uh, draw close to ending. So Saul didn't do what he was supposed to do. Saul went out and did something, and then Samuel warned him. What have you done? And then Samuel told him. Samuel goes on to tell him. He said, for now... The Lord would have established your kingdom in Israel forever, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people, because you have not kept the command of the Lord. At that moment, Samuel told him, you know what, you've already had a couple mishaps, and now you have went against God, 
and you have stepped in and tried to act like God and God's not having it. Saul, you are not going to be allowed to be king no more. I'm, just, I'm giving you notice right now. It might not happen right now, but God is raising up someone that's going to stand up and raise the standard. They might not look what everybody wants. They might not act how everybody wants. They might not be from the right family. They might not be, but God's raising up someone that will have his heart. And I'm telling you right now, in this church, God's not looking for the most polished people. God's not looking for people that have the right background. God's not looking for people that come from the wealthy family. God is looking for people that have their heart sold out to him, that will listen to him, not get a big head not go out and try to control everything but they will walk in humility and do what God called them to do amen God was already moving here spoiler alert most of you guys know who God was calling and we're going to be talking to him in the weeks about him in the weeks to come and that was a powerful young man by the name of David whose feats are still talked about today whose fame is still extremely popular all over the world especially in Israel But it's not David that we serve. It's Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So Saul did this unlawful sacrifice. He also neglected to get his people the right kind of weapons. I told you, they didn't have the right kind of blacksmiths. So actually, during this time, the Philistines, their enemy. This is crazy how much this lines up to what's going on right now. And if you guys are into that stuff, you guys can fill in the blanks for yourselves, okay? They, the enemy is the one that controlled all the weapons. And so God's people literally had to go down to the Philistines and pay double time to get their plows sharpened, to get their axes sharpened. They had to go to the enemy to do that. Greatly, greatly. It was an uneven match. The Philistines had more. But this is something that I want to focus on. So Saul and his son find themselves in a place where they were in Gibeah of Benjamin. And it says the Philistines encamped in Michmash, verse 17 of 13. Then raiders came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. One company turned on the road to Ophrah, and the other is Shaul. Another company turned to the road of Beth Horan. These are all cities, okay? And another company turned to the road to the border that overlooks the valley of Zeboam toward the wilderness. Verse 19 through 23 talks about what I just told you about. There was no blacksmiths to help out the children of Israel. They had to pay double. Verse uh, chapter 14. Now it happened one day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, the one whom we don't hear about, the one who wasn't called to be king, the one that was walking in humility, Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he did not tell his father. And Saul was sitting in the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. The people who were with him were about 600 men. Ahijah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, was wearing an ephod. But the people did not know where Jonathan had gone. So they find themselves in a place where he's with his dad. They're sitting out there. His dad's sitting under a tree just taking it easy. They have 600 men. They don't want to go and approach the enemy because, hey, man, we only got 600 men. But not too long ago, we heard of another man who only had 300 men that God sent out to destroy the army that was against them. And look who was there with them. Phineas, the son of Eli, the wicked priests. One of their lineage was there. Instructing them. Verse 4. Between the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on one side and a sharp rock on the other side. And the name was Bozez, and the other name was Sene. The front of the face northward, opposite of Michmash, and the other toward opposite of Gibeah. They went through this valley. They began to go through this valley where there was rough terrain. And they walked down through it, Jonathan and his armor bearer. What was an armor bearer? An armor bearer was someone who would walk with their leader, right, their master, and they would protect them at all costs. They were there to be with them, to have their weapons, to fight with them. It was a guard. It was their security. It was a faithful friend that would do anything. 
And they walked down in there. Verse 6. Then Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go to the garrison of these uncircumcised. When they say uncircumcised, they're speaking of Gentiles because God had called the people of Israel, right, to be circumcised. Let's go to the uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. So his armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart. Go then. Here I am with you according to your heart. Then Jonathan said, Very well. Let us cross over there. And Jonathan began to make a deal with his armor bearer. He told his armor bearer, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to pray. It's just me and you. We're going to go up to this place where our enemy is at. The enemy's coming down. Jonathan already knew that his dad was scared. He knew that his dad was scared and that people were fearful in the camp of Israel. So he said, me and you, we're going to go alone. Can you imagine? The Philistine army was huge. And here we have two guys that roll up there by themselves. I'd like to think of Jonathan and his armor bearer, kind of like John Wick and 007 hanging out together, right? These are some bad dudes, okay? They rolled up there, and they were like, let's go, let's go handle this. Let's go take care of it, right? We're going to do this. But Jonathan stopped. You see, unlike his father who said, Samuel hasn't showed up yet. We're just going to make a sacrifice on God's behalf. Jonathan stops there, and by faith he says, listen, this is what we're going to do. We pray out to God, and we're going we're gonna to call up to them. If they tell us, if the Philistines say, come up here so we can show you something. He's like, then we know that God has delivered them into our hands, and it's a sign that we can go take them. He's like, but if they tell us that they're going to come down here to us, we take that as a sign that God is not with us, and it's not time to fight, and we better go. And so they, they, they near this place, and they call up. And they call back, and they say, come up here so we can show you something. And Jonathan is, and his armor bearer went up. It says that they didn't just walk up. It says they climbed with their hands and feet as fast as they could up. They drew their swords, and they slew 20 men. You might say, well, that's not a very big army. It's not. There was hundreds of thousands of them. But that was the garrison that was right there. They went to the top, and they slew that garrison. And immediately after they went up and slew that garrison, fear began to spread through all the Philistines, saying, what's going on here? So Saul, the great leader, does a roll call. Hey, what's going on? I can see down in the valley. These Philistines are running everywhere. Something's, what's going on? He's like, let's figure out who... Who from our army is still here? Because something's not right. And he does a roll call, and he finds out that his son and his armor bearer have taken off to go start war without them. And he's like, oh, boy, okay. And so he's like, we got to do this. So he calls up the armies. He's like, let's go. We've got to go. And they go down there, and it says that they begin to draw the Philistines away, and the Lord confused them. And they begin to run away, and it says that all the people from different from different areas, begin to come out and join the fight and begin to push back the Philistines. Now, there's a couple differences here between what Jonathan had done and between what God had called Saul to do. In the first stage of battle, Saul was oblivious. While Jonathan was fighting the battle, Saul was doing nothing sitting underneath a tree. Just, eh, we'll just wait. It's interesting that with an enemy to fight and a battle to win, Saul and his 600 men were doing nothing. Saul didn't seek the Lord. Saul didn't pray. Saul didn't ask for God's will. Saul didn't ask for God to come and show him and speak to him so that they can go and help his son. Saul didn't, he didn't do nothing. He wasn't trusting God for the victory. But what Jonathan did, number one, real quick, was an act of courage. You see, him and his armor bearer faced a huge army. There was only two of them. They went into battle with terrible odds against them. Jonathan and his armor bearer showed tremendous courage. Not only was Jonathan brave, but his armor bearer was so trusting and obedient to follow his friend into war against an enemy that would have surely gotten the upper hand had they not acted. Because why? There was fear in the camp. Jonathan, his other act that he did that day was an act of faith. Jonathan trusted God to win the battle. 
He knew that they were limited when it came to numbers, but he understood that he was not limited by the power of God against the enemy. He made a decision based on how the enemy behaved, much like we're going to see that David did the same thing. Jonathan knew that God had already knew what was going to happen, and he trusted God for full victory. What Jonathan did that day also was an act of unselfishness. You see, we had just heard that God wasn't going to bless them no more. Now, if you remember anything, remember this. I know some people don't study the Bible, and you're like, what the heck? This is so confusing. That's why it's important that you study your Bible. This is important stuff. But I'm going to wrap it up for you in a way that I want you to remember it. You see, Saul was so focused on self, so focused on doing things his way, so focused on being patted on the back, so focused on everyone seeing him and giving him honor. But his son was humble, and he sought after the heart of the Lord, and he wanted God to truly bless him. You see, Samuel knew that Saul was not cut out to do the job, but God knew that there was a line coming up that would fulfill what he always desired to happen. Even after Samuel told Saul, you're not going to be king no more. You're done. You lost that. Your bloodline lost that. You'll never be king. Jonathan didn't change his tone just because the gift was taken away. Just because he wasn't promised power, Jonathan didn't say, I'm not going to serve the Lord no more. I'm not going to. I'm not going to, what do I have to serve God for? I'm not going to be king. But as we see, Jonathan fought. He was honorable. He was humble. And when it came time to turn the kingdom over to someone that was not part of their family, he did so with a gracious heart. I'm not going to be king. I'm going to give it to a young man named David. Saul didn't react because of fear. There's many people, there's many Christians that are fearful to get close to God because they're scared of this, they're scared of that. They're scared to be made fun of, they're scared. But I'll tell you, there's so many fears. Oh, the enemy's going to attack me. You're darn right the enemy's going to attack you. The closer you get to God, the more we are going to realize how dirty we all are. The closer you get to God, people begin to feel, man, I'm not worthy. Anybody ever get like that in your walk with God? The closer you get to him, it becomes very evident that we're not, man, I'm so dirty, I'm filthy, I have bad habits. I don't, I've had people come to me, Dave, I don't even want to serve God no more because I feel like I'm a piece of trash. I feel like I'll never be good enough. And that's not what God's saying, that's what the devil's saying. The point of coming closer to God is that we see that we can never do it on our own, but that it was the blood shed on the cross that was able to save us, change us, and bring us to the Father. It was by him. He did it. God looks at all of our hearts, and he knows who we are. I told you already. It's not about sitting in a church on a Sunday morning. Some people are just sitting in church every week, and they're like, eh, I don't even care. I want to get out of here. But it's not about a church. It's about Jesus. Well, Dave, I don't even believe in Jesus. I don't even care what you're saying. I've made up my mind. God is fake. I'd love to have that debate with you someday if you want to have that debate. God isn't real. God is this. Well, let me tell you something that I often tell people when we're ministering in certain areas. They say, your God's not real, dude. You're a looney tune. I say, well, check this out, man. Here's something you should think about. If God isn't real and Jesus isn't real, and the Bible is fake, and y'all are wasting your time being here today? If you serve the Lord, then what have you truly lost? If you truly read the word of God and surrender to it, the Bible taught me how to treat my wife the right way. The Bible taught me to drop the machismo and learn to love my wife like he loved the church. The Bible taught me 
to be respectful and loving and not just sit there and look down, but to get under and help her and lift her up and elevate her. The Bible taught me that, no one else. The Bible taught me how to raise my kids the right way. The Bible taught me not just how to chop them down and degrade them, but how to pray over them, lift them up, and build them up. The Bible taught me how to treat people. The Bible taught me that it's not about hoarding all the money to myself, but it's about helping people that are in need and being there for them. Even the people that hate my guts. There might be some people in here that hate my guts. I don't doubt that one bit. The Bible taught me not to look back at someone and say, oh, I hate you too, what's up? The Bible taught me to look at them and say, I love you no matter what you do. And you can look at me with all the hate that you want, but I'm going to look back at you and I'm going to say, I, I pray to God that he blesses you. The Bible taught me how to be a decent person. If the Bible isn't real and God isn't real, what have I lost? Nothing. My life has been better. But if you don't believe in God and you're gambling on that, then what are you going to lose? You're going to lose eternity. That's right. I'm not just giving a speech to you today. I don't care who hears me. I don't care who gives a pat on the back. I don't care about looking manly or a certain way up here. I'm here to cry out and say, Jesus is coming soon. Get your life right. Yeah. Our kids are dying. Maybe you don't see it because you're at home and you never leave your house and it's just about your family. But there's people being wiped out out there. There's kids that don't have dads out there that are being shot down in our streets here in Denver. There's young ladies that are being sold into prostitution and their lives are being destroyed while we sit here and play church. When are we going to wake up and take it seriously? Make fun of me. Call me weak for crying. I don't care. I care about them. I care about what God wants to do. We play games. We complain about our lives. We complain about what we don't have. We complain about what we've been through. But in other countries, they're being murdered for reading their Bible. In other countries, they're being hung in North Korea, in Saudi Arabia. They're being hung for reading the Bible. But here, we use it as a coaster. Here, we mock God. Here, we say we're so oppressed. We're not oppressed here. But the day's coming that we're going to know what oppression is like here. And just like the Bible says, he's going to separate the wheat from the chaff. He's going to find out who really loves him and who really doesn't. And I don't know about you. I may not be the smartest guy in the world. I'm definitely not the biggest guy in the world. I may not be qualified to do a lot of stuff. I may not have a better education than a lot of you guys. But I'll tell you one thing about me. I'm willing to go out there and do what I got to do for Jesus Christ. And I pray that you are too. This isn't a game. I'm not up here acting for anybody. I don't need anybody's pat on the back. But I'm here to encourage everybody in here that everybody in here is special. Everybody in here is loved by Jesus. Everybody in here has a calling to do something great. Some of you guys are going to do things that I could never dream of doing. It's not about a pastor and being professional. It's about you being the priest of your home. If you're in here today and you bear unforgiveness, I believe that there's marriages in this place that need to be healed right now. I believe there's husbands and wives that need to come together and say, I'm sorry for the way I've treated you. I'm sorry for what I've done. Forgive me. There needs to be healing so we can move forward. I believe there's people in here that need to tell their kids, I'm sorry. I believe there are kids that need to tell their parents, I'm sorry for what I've done. And I believe there's people in this church that need to tell each other, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for letting controlling spirits take over. I'm sorry for not listening. I'm sorry for destructive behavior. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Because despite anybody else, God's going to do what he has to do in this church. He doesn't need any of us. You want to know how real God is? When you roll into a room, like I said, I wish you guys could see it. When you roll into a room full of Satanists, 
wearing their Baphomet shirts. When you roll into a room full of people that hate Jesus. And someone doesn't go up to them and say, you're going to hell. You're going to hell. You're nobody. You're a loser. But instead you go up to them and you say, bro, I don't know what you've been through. I know you don't believe in the Jesus that I believe in. But I love you, bro. I love you. I love you. And I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to pray that God revolutionize. And when you begin to see tears begin to flow down their eyes, and you see, you begin to realize something really important. I don't know why God's telling me to say this, but I have to say it. We have made people our enemies. They're evil. That group is evil. Oh, it's all the Republicans. Oh, it's all the Democrats. Oh, it's all this. It has never been about people. It's been about evil spirits. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and wicked spirits. And I'm here to tell you, if you want victory in your family, in your marriage, in your job, in your church, we need to quit blaming the people and we need to start submitting and praying against the enemy and the attacks that are coming against us. I don't know if anybody in here has ever, ever dealt with spiritual warfare. I don't know if anybody in here has ever seen a demon, seen demonic entities. I'm not here to prove anything to anybody. But I've seen everything I've ever needed to see to know what's real and what's not. And that's why I stand here before you today. I know I'm beating a dead horse for people that go to my church here, but I'm saying this for everyone else's benefit. If I didn't know that Jesus Christ is who he says he is, why would I be standing up here embarrassing myself in front of a bunch of people? It's definitely not about the money, trust me. It's definitely not about popularity. Most people don't like me no more. My own family won't hang out with me most of the time. It's because God has been too good to me. When I should have been dead. When I should have lost my wife. When I should have lost my kids. When the devil wanted to take my life out several times. During car accidents. When I was jumped and left beaten on the ground while my pregnant wife watched. Because I was acting a fool with a jaw hanging off to the side with blood pouring out of my face with broken ribs, messed up when I should have died. God save me. When I had a revolver put in my mouth and the trigger was ready to be pulled and the Lord spoke and the Lord delivered me from that spirit, I thank God because I should have been dead, but it's only by the grace of God that I'm standing for you today. I'm not here. I'm not here to just preach a, a Sunday sermon that gives everyone goosebumps. I'm here to share the truth that people can see that it's not about being polished. It's not about being perfect. It's not about acting religious. It's just about loving Jesus and saying, God, I want to give you the chance in my life. Please be who I need you to be. I may not be perfect, but take who I am. The Bible says, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And this is what God told me. There's a few of you in here right now that you're tired. You're tired. Some of you guys have served the Lord for a long time, and you've been beat up. You've been, you've been ran through the ringer, and you're exhausted. And you're like, Lord, I just need to be refreshed by your word. I'm going to ask you to come up in a minute. But there's also some of you that have been hurt by the church. Church people have hurt you. Churches have hurt you. And I want to ask for forgiveness for anybody that has ever hurt you. I want to ask for forgiveness if I've ever hurt you. And you're tired. You're, Dave, I'm tired of life. Dave, I'm tired of relationships never working out. I'm tired of being lonely. Dave, I'm tired of watching my kids go through hell. Dave, I'm tired of struggling with this marriage. I'm tired. I need God's help. I can't do it on my own. If you are tired and you are weary, then I want you to come to the Lord, not to a man, not to a church altar, but I want you to come to the Lord in faith and say, God, begin to help me. And let me give a word of wisdom. 
Just because you stand up here doesn't mean that things change overnight. But by coming up here, you say, Lord, I'm willing to deny myself, pick up my cross, and begin to read your word so that you can impact my life. And if you do that, I promise God will begin to lead you the right way. Is there anybody that's tired here today? I'm not going to coerce anybody. You know if the Holy Spirit's talking to you, it's between you and God. If there's anybody that's tired, I'm the first one up here. I'm exhausted. I'm tired. You guys know this. I just had a conversation with Gary and Cindy about this this last week. I don't have what it takes to lead you guys. I'm not smart enough. But guess what? I know who is, and I'm connected to him, and he's leading me, and he's guiding me, and he's going to continue to guide us. But I'm tired. It's been a long journey. Some of you guys have been here for years. But look what God's doing. Look how faithful God is. Look at all the new souls that are coming to God. Despite not having a perfect church, despite not having the best sound system, Despite having a pastor that really can't write a sermon very eloquently. Despite not having all the things, but just coming to the Lord with an open heart with the Holy Spirit. Look around at what God is doing. If you're tired today and you want God to heal your heart, and you want to begin that healing, then I want you to come up here. I want you to make your way up here if you're tired. Don't look to anybody else. It has nothing to do with them. This is your life. If you're tired and you want God to heal you, come on up. And I'm going to have these guys sing a song. That's going to bless you guys, and we're going to usher in the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I just want you guys to come up. If I could have some ushers just uh, by these guys, and I'm going to pray over you guys. Amen?